one of the people who was taped recently referred to Lady Bird as uh, Lyndon Johnson's North Star. Uh -huh. Would you comment on that? Yeah. Well, that is a that is a um, um, a lovely comment, and she um, she was she was an anchor for it, uh, as well as something to follow. And I did um, uh, recently run across uh, some notes that she had done in, in shorthand when she had um, she had been listening to a, I guess she'd been listening to a Johnson press conference and from the East Room and she had been watching it on television and she had made these uh, notes about um, how he should. Um, Look, uh, how he should look into the camera, and how his uh, pauses were good, but how his pauses could be improved, and um, words to emphasize. And she was, um, um, she was. Um, they they were not uh, critical comments. They were things that uh, she thought would improve his presentation. And she, um, when I didn't know Mrs. Johnson when she was, uh, when people talked about her as being this shy, um, uh, little uh, butterfly, fragile person, I knew her um, after she had been in uh, speech classes with Hester Bell Provinson and um, would. Uh, and she knew how to uh, mark her speech cards, and she knew how to uh, emphasize certain sections and how to look at an audience. And sometimes you would just walk into her room. You were coming. I was coming over to work with her on perhaps a guest list or an, a White House entertainment, <clears throat> and I'd walk into her bedroom where her desk was, and she would stand up and start uh, talking to me and it would be kind of a shock, momentary shock, because before I realized that what she was doing, she was using me as the audience to practice her, to practice her speech cards. But um, Mrs. Johnson is a person who I don't think in her whole life was ever bored because she had this deep curiosity deep curiosity about everything and everybody, whether it was learning about a new plant and what would make it grow, or whether it was a new person, or whether she was seeing you for, um, and she hadn't seen you a while. She was interested in what you were doing, uh, what you were interested in, and she just viewed life as um, a, a rich experience, and I sometimes thought um, of that line in the play Annie Mame, where Annie Mame says that life is a banquet and most poor fools are just starving to death. Well, Mrs. Johnson was never starving to death, and when you were around her, you were never starving to death either because um, she brought you into of the excitement of what she was interested in and what she was doing and um, new things that um, that that she was exploring, and that's one of the um, reasons that the Wildflower Center first called the what the National Wildflower Research Center and then became. Um, over Mrs. Johnson's initial protest because she did not want it named after her, but after it had been in business for, I guess, about 18 years, it was renamed the Lady Bird Johnson Wildflower Center. But she always had a, um, a joy in life and um, a joy in discovery, a joy in doing something something new and exploring something new. I was with her in uh, the Virgin Islands. She had gone down to 
<clears throat> give the graduation address at the University of the Virgin Islands. And after the um, uh, ceremonial activities at the university, we went over to the island of St. John <clears throat> for two days of R&R, &R, rest and relaxation. And I had brought along my mask and flippers and snorkel to go out and see this, the, the wonderful things in that clear water of the Caribbean. And she, she wanted to go too. So we got a mask and flippers and snorkel for her. And I had been with other people when that was the first time they had put a mask on their face and breathing through a tube through the water. And there's a, a, a certain time getting used to it and a little bit of uh, discomfort. But for Mrs. Johnson, as soon as she put that mask on and put her face in the water and realized that she was like her very own glass bottom boat and she could see what was on this, um, uh, the, the floor of the Caribbean and she could see all these beautiful fish and the coral and so forth. She just never wanted to take her head out of the water. Uh, we had this uh, ranger naturalist with us, a, a man named Noble Samuels, who knew all the flora and fauna, whether it was above, um, above the um, earth or below the water. And <clears throat> at one point, um, she was swimming along with um, Noble, and she took her head out of the water, and she said, Noble, what is that silvery fish with the, the long mouth? And instead of answering her directly, he pointed to another quite wonderful, colorful fish and told her about that fish and um, what it did and what its name was and what it ate. And <clears throat> sometime later, when we got back in the boat, Mrs. Johnson said to Noble, that long silver fish with the long mouth, that was a barracuda, wasn't it? And he said, well, yes, Mrs. Johnson, but it wasn't going to bother you. So she had. Um, it was a great day of uh, discovery of things in the um, things in the water and what they did and what they ate. And she um, she was back in the water the next day and has enjoyed snorkeling since then. I think she was about 55 then. And to um, show that she's always doing and always doing new things, I think it was about two years later. I think she was 57 when she learned to water ski. Uh, soon after the Johnsons came to the White House, Mrs. Johnson was interviewed by a, a reporter who wanted to know her um, theories on entertaining and uh, what sort of uh, menus they would be serving and, and what sort of flowers and what, uh, how, they, how the tables would be decorated. And after listening to this very long question, Mrs. Johnson just said, oh my goodness, I've had to worry about those things for more than 20 years. And now I'm in this beautiful house and we have this wonderful staff, um, all these people that worry about those things. I don't have to worry about those things anymore. I can concentrate on the guests. And that's what she did, both who to invite and once they were invited, how to make that experience of being in the White House a rich and wonderful time for them and she would before uh, before a, a large large or small occasion she would study the guest list and um, go over who was who was going to be there and think about um, introducing various people to each other but also making that brief experience of guests when they go through a receiving line of making that um, a meaningful moment, having something uh, to say to that guest, whether it was an author about his book. And one of the things that she did with, um, with authors was that she would have them uh, autograph their books that were to be placed in the White House Library, which made the book more wonderful for the White House Library, and also it was a wonderful um, flattering thing to do for the, for the author. 
but she would, and people going through the receiving line, she would say, now I want you to meet so-and-so. Um, or she would um, uh, tell them that she wanted them to see some object that was in the White House that might have come from their state or that they might have some um, special tie with. When uh, Mr. Johnson was vice president, the, um, uh, the ambassador of Iran used to send over to the vice president's house about every six or seven weeks um, a big box of pistachio nuts from Iran and also a wonderful, generous tin of that fabulous um, Iranian caviar from the Caspian Sea. And the Johnsons just delighted in that, enjoyed the pistachio nuts, and reveled in, the, in uh, enjoying this fabulous caviar from Iran. And after they had been in the White House for several months, uh, Mrs. Johnson called me and she said, I keep signing these letters to the ambassador of Iran, thanking him for the pistachio nuts and thanking him for the caviar. Where are the pistachio nuts and where is the caviar? And I said, well, I have no idea. I thought that it would be going to you. But upon a little investigation, I found that the Secret Service just destroyed any um, foodstuffs that were sent to the president or his family. So I relayed this to Mrs. Johnson and said that the, um, the Secret Service said that they were sorry, but any foodstuff that came to the president or his family had to be destroyed. And there was a long pause in this conversation with Mrs. Johnson, Mrs. Johnson and she said, well, <clears throat> you call the Secret Service and tell them to send me the pistachio nuts and send me the caviar and I will take care of destroying it personally. One time I was in um, in Texas with um, Mrs. Johnson, and this was before the days of, of uh, plastic, of credit cards and um, uh, ATM bank cards where you could just plug a card in and assuming you weren't overdrawn at the bank, you could get some cash. Well, this was before those days. And <clears throat> I had stayed down in Texas longer than I had anticipated and I'd run out of cash. So I'd asked Mrs. Johnson if she would cash a check for me. She said, yes, indeed. So um, we drove to the bank and I wrote her a check and she um, was going to take it into the um, bank and cash it. And she looked at it and she said, my goodness, you and Tyler have a joint checking account? And I said, well, yes, ma'am. And she said, my goodness. I wouldn't have a joint checking account with the angel Gabriel. Um, I do uh, um, have always seen Mrs. Johnson as somebody who was looking forward um, and uh, a positiveness about life and I do believe that she believes the best in um, the best in us, and the best um, that if you if if you think um, about goodness in people, that um, they will respond. But in one of her, one of the things that she has enjoyed in that business, of, I think of as looking forward, is. The, um, the children of her friends. And at a time in, uh, in her life when politics personally for herself and for President Johnson was passed, she enjoyed um, thinking about and knowing about the sons and daughters of friends of theirs and sons and daughters of people who had been in the Johnson administration going into uh, politics and running for office and um, 
I, it was just another link with the future. And, well, that's not very interesting. Um, one Saturday, I had come in to work with Mrs. Johnson on some guest lists and some entertainments. And it was um, a lovely summer day, and we were sitting out on the Truman balcony. And she looked at me and she said, you just look very tired and very haggard. Um, what is happening that, that you just seem so exhausted? And I said, oh, Mrs. Johnson, we've moved into this new house, and I just don't think that, that I'll ever get finished. She said, well, of course not, dear. You never get finished with the house. You never get finished until you move out. And that is so true, and it's something I've reminded myself often and also reminded friends of mine when they get in that same shape that, well, of course not. You'll never be finished with your house, not till the day you move out. Well, that is all I have to say unless you can think of something else. That's very good. It's, uh, it's a great picture of her. Um, talk a little bit about how the Johnsons um, treated the staff as family. Because mm -hmm. I don't think that's ever been done before. More sense. Mm -hmm. Well, then, don't, don't, um, this yet. One of, one of the things that I remember, um, as if I can put it together, is how the, um, I don't, I don't like comparisons, but when I, at, at one point, called somebody in my office who had worked in, <coughs> in Mrs. Kennedy's, um, social office and I asked them to bring something up to the second floor of the White House they were they they wanted to really be sure that, that, that they had heard what I said and then afterwards said that it was the first time that they had been on the, the second floor of the um, of the White House that's um, but that that's not that's not it. It's um, <clears throat> well, they brought us in as guests. They brought us in. Um, we were part of their part of their life, part of their part of their family. Um, it was a great thing to be a part of. Um, it really did um, adopt you. I, you're not running this, are you? Are you no, running this? Running. No, no, no. Oh, shoot. Stop for a minute. What? Oh, yeah, stop that. for a minute. Um, um, uh, Linda. And that's the way Tyler grew up. So f for us, it wasn't unusual, but I have crossed it with, um, with my daughter-in-law, who, <laughs> my friend Ann Wood, who has the office back there and it has used that space in the house for a long time as an office, De Deborah just took, well, she said, what is this? Um, and most of us who worked for President and Mrs. Johnson <clears throat> became a part of their part of their family. They were um, they were interested in us. They were interested in our children. They were interested in um, 
uh, what we were doing and we were just um, a, a part of their life and vice versa. Um, I think everybody that that worked for them in the Senate, the vice presidential, the White House years, really felt um, a part of their family, and they made us part of the family. They included <coughs> they included us in uh, special events. They would um, invite staff members to. Um, sometimes come to state dinners, sometimes for um, a reception. Uh, toward the end of the Johnson administration, the President Mrs. Johnson wanted to be sure that everybody who worked for them was invited to something or another, and we began having more and more people come in after dinner for, for dancing at, um, at events. In fact, one um, one evening, one of the last state dinners, the uh, president was dancing with various people, and he was dancing with uh, one woman who, named Betty Tilson, who worked in uh, Mrs. Johnson's correspondence office. And he came over to me afterwards and said, now, what does Betty Tilson do? And I told him that she wrote absolutely the very best letters. Um, drafted the very best letters for Mrs. Johnson. And he said, oh. Well, then he went over and um, asked Betty Tilson to come to Texas with him. And by golly, Betty <coughs> and her husband Don <coughs> moved to Austin, Texas, and Don got a job <coughs> down there. I think maybe he worked for the government anyway, and he got a, a transfer to a job in, <coughs> in Austin, Texas. And Betty and Don um, became a member of the of the Johnson extended family, uh, but they, they included us in Christmas. They um, uh, they were a part of people's weddings, a part of their joys, a part of their sadnesses, and we were a part of theirs. The uh, another thing is that the um, the family quarters of the White House were open to staff because we had that that area of the White House in past administrations had basically there was a line across there and you didn't go up the elevator to the second floor but the um, with the Johnsons there were meetings up there uh, there were um, uh, luncheons dinners um, it was just a part of the house that we knew as well as the state floor. Is that? That, that party they had, that was the last night they were in the White House, wasn't mm -hmm. it? And they had it for the staff. Right. Which is rather touching. Okay. The, the, the last night that the Johnsons were in the White House, they had, um, well, the second to last night they were there, they had a party for the members of the president's cabinet and their wives. And the last night they were in the White House, they had a party for their staff and where we took pictures and shared memories. And it's a very special memory looking back at that, the dinner in the uh, family dining room upstairs and cocktails before and coffee afterwards in the yellow oval room with that lovely view out the window across the South Lawn to the Washington Monument and the Jefferson Memorial beyond, the prettiest view in the White House. That's good. That's good. I like particularly what you said about you shared their happiness and shared their sadness. Yeah. And they shared yours. Right. That's, that's nice. It's a nice touch. And then before I did tell that great story about <coughs> Mrs. Johnson saying that um, she was, um, oh, when she, when we asked her if she was going to um, miss the White House, shall I do that again? Yes. <coughs> the. 
<clears throat> uh, toward the very end of the Johnson administration, I was driving out of the White House grounds with Mrs. Johnson. We were going off to some uh, embassy uh, reception. And it was a lovely evening. The sun was setting, and um, it was just uh, the sky was beautiful. The, the, um, you could see the inaugural platform going up there on Pennsylvania Avenue as we were going out the North Gate. <coughs> and I uh, said to Mrs. Johnson, as so we were leaving this beautiful house, I said, are you going to miss all this when you're back in Texas? And she said, oh, yes, I'm just going to miss it. I'm going to miss it like a front tooth. But you know there's just absolutely nothing in the world that would make me willing to pay the price for another ticket of admission. <laughs>